Was it a big change for you to do daily radio at first? Oh, it was a big, big change. Um, I'd come from television and I actually thought radio was going to be easier um, than television, but um, it turned out to be a lot harder, actually. Um, especially a programme like Morning Report where you've got no ads and you've got, you know, three hours that you're talking for. Um, so, yeah, it's... Um, I've, I've found it more challenging um, than, than television and... It took me longer, actually, as a transition to, to, to get into it and to get used to it and to feel comfortable with it than, than I had thought. I mean, pe people said to me, oh, it's just um, t television without the pictures. But, um, no, it's really not. It's actually a lot, a lot different from that. Mm. And, um, yeah, it's a pretty sort of um, particular audience at Morning Report as well. So they've, they've got their views about uh, what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing. So. And, and I have to say, early on, that audience kind of thought that you shouldn't be being quite as aggressive um, as you were. I mean, there, there was a feeling that, that you and Susie were perhaps being a, a little too attack dog, <clears throat> but also a feeling that you were doing it to the wrong people. You were being mean to the left. Yeah, look, I think um, when, we, when we first took over, um, well, I speak for myself. I mean, Susie speaks very eloquently for herself every morning, so I, I won't uh, pretend to do that. But I think that criticism, um, apart from the last bit you said, is probably fair in that um, I think I was probably too aggressive uh, at first. It's very much about picking your moments. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm aggressive to either side of the political spectrum, left, right and centre. We don't um, put any favours there. Um, but I think um, probably started out a bit too hard, to be to be fair, and got a, quite a bit of pushback. It's funny as a journalist, I mean, you're always wanting to get to the bottom of something, you don't want to let people get away with something, and so you push pretty hard. But there's a sort of balance of sympathies that I always sort of look for. You know, you've got to make sure the audience knows why you are doing that, and if you elevate something really, really quickly to a really high stakes thing and really push for answers too soon, then, you know, I think you can alienate people. Um, journalists love aggressive interviews, but I don't know always that, aud that the aud audience do. I, I got a lot of flack just uh, a few days, or actually just this week. God, yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> for an interview with Lawrence Yule that I did and I thought, look, you know, the guy's a public official, he's presiding over this uh, really serious public health issue and um, it's the middle of an election campaign. And so I went, I went at him, I don't know who heard it, but went at him reasonably hard. I got, it's funny, the feedback is very different. The text messages and emails, which I think are more conservative, they're all like, how could you? And I was being called all, all sorts of names. Twitter was a bit more um, friendly to me on that one. Um, but, um, yeah, in short answer to your question, I think we did go out too hard at the, at the beginning. And, um, you know, there's room for a bit of humour, a bit of light and shade, you know, even on uh, national radio. So, um, yeah, I think we've probably lightened up a bit. It's probably a good thing. So you do read your texts, emails and... and Twitter. Yep, I got them up. I've got um, te a text machine on a computer screen, um, email and Twitter, and I will look at that quite a bit. So if you tweet or email or text me, I'll probably pick it up. Might even read it. Might even read it out on air if it says something nice about me. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how often is it the case that people are abusive towards you? And what do you do about that? Oh, I usually just laugh. I mean, I get, um, yeah, I get quite a lot of that. Um, you get some, yeah, I mean, it's a big audience, so you get some real freaks, you know. Some people, um, some people um, take exception to um, using Māori language, and they'll be on the text me on national radio. You get some guy, you know, from Gisborne, weirdly, texting me and saying, you know, why are you using all this Māori language, you know. So you get, you get strange sort of freaks like that, and you just don't bother about it. Um, when you get a pile on on Twitter, it can be a bit of a bit of a nuisance. But actually, we should talk talk, talk about Maori language. We should talk about your your intro in the real. It's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're trying, we're trying. How much did you practice that? Because oh. I, I, I was doing um, media tucker with, with Toy uh, when you started doing that. He's like, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been battling away on on the Maori language. My my wife's a pretty good pretty good speaker, and um, from her family, I've, I've learned a bit too. But I've been battling away with the books, and um, it was really cool to do Maori language week um, this year with um, Mihi. Um, which was which was really cool. We got an amazing amount of cool feedback from that. And so, look, you know, they were exceptions, those negative ones. I mean, people were very positive. In fact, we got um, we got that stuff up on video, and people were watching it. And um, yeah, we got heaps of good feedback. It was good. How much does the agenda setting nature of the show um, come into your thoughts when, when you're preparing? Because it is a fact that if you if you 
particularly get an interview right, it will be what's talked about for the rest of the day and it will probably set the frame for the story. Yeah, I mean, um, hopefully that's right and that's what we do aim to do. Um, and so I come in, um, I'm in about 4.30, we have about an hour 15 to prep, so, you know, um, before we go on air at 6. Sometimes, some mornings I'll be doing 7, 8, 9, 10 interviews, um, but I'll know what the big ones are, and if I've got a minister on particularly, I'll, um, I'll really try and dig into some deep detail to, to try and get enough knowledge to unsettle them a little bit or pick a little bit deeper, you know, because the detail is what catches you. You're amazed. If you dig deep enough, even in that time, you can, you know, you can get somewhere. And um, so it's about picking your moments, about what, what, to, what to prep for. And other ones are very much on the fly. You know, you'll have a story breaking and you'll just, you'll just have to pick it up and run with it. Um, so it's a bit like swatting for an exam, really. But you, you pick the, the ones you know you're going to have a big impact and, and try and dig a bit deeper on those ones. That's, that's usually my strategy. Um, I, I've been in once to, to be on Morning Report and, and sit around and, and watch what was going on for a while and I was struck by how much it is on the fly and I guess it has to be, you know, there's talk coming up and down the line, you're deciding what you're going to do next. It, it, that, that's kind of interesting actually. Yeah, it's, 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 it's not quite as formal as people think. No. Well it's formal when you come in in the morning they've got a run down saying what you're going to do and that looks all sweet. You know, are oh, we going to do this? Here's three hours of radio. Uh, no problem. But then the world happens and um, something breaks in America, someone's getting shot over here, we're following a story from the Herald, they finally ring back, you get them on, um, you know, someone doesn't front, so a story that you were thinking was 40 minutes away suddenly is uh, 30 seconds away and you look at the intro and you can't pronounce any of the names and know what you're talking about. Um, so, you know, there's a bit of a um, seat of the pants stuff uh, to it, which which keeps it fun and um, and immediate, you know. Um, and that, that is a big difference from the from the TV and print stuff you've done. Is that there are very few situations where you have to live on your wits like that compared to radio, where it's live radio. I think the time I was in, you hadn't prepped for something, and <gasps> okay. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, someone will say, "Well, you're doing this interview now," and you're like, "Oh my god!" And you'll just you know, um, you you'll just grab you know, whatever notes were there and, and just try try and wing it. Um, so yeah, that keeps it fun. Mm. So it's, 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 as the rugby coaches say, it's playing what's in front of you. In, in that respect it is, yeah. But then, um, you know, I'll also have those interviews that I've, you know, prepped for, you know, maybe 40 minutes on something and actually written out a question line for a minister and think, oh, this is the strategy of the interview and actually written out the exact quotes and dug into the read most of the cabinet paper and it really is about picking your moments. I mean, some things work well on the fly, others don't. I mean, I'm amazed some journalists go into interviews with ministers who have been prepped to the nines and had know their way out of anything, and they just seem to be flinging questions at them. It's never gonna, you're never gonna get anything different than just the spin lines if you just if you just blunder into it. So I, I well, maybe if you're really good, I, I tend to feel that I need enough uh, detail and structure to a, a big picture interview like that to actually, you know, nut it out quite a bit. Is there anyone you really hate interviewing? And I'm thinking, <laughs> Winston Peters. Well, Winston takes a while to crack. The last interview I had with Winston, um, I think I admitted smoking cannabis on national radio. Not that I smoke cannabis on national, on national radio. radio right? But um, <laughs> it was fun. Tweet that. And, um, <laughs> you know, someone got in touch with me, or someone went on Twitter and said, you actually made Winston Peters laugh from, I think they said the heart, would that be fair? Or the, or the stomach or whatever. Um, it, was, it, was, it was fun and, and you know, We've all had the scraps with Winston. It's a bit of a rite of passage in journalism. Um, and they're great fun. And you'll have a stash, and we'll have a stash with him in election year. You know, who are you going to go with? And there'll be a fright over that. But, um, yeah, he, he's, he's mellowed a bit too, though. Eh? He's, he's a bit different now. He's, he's changed a bit. Um, so I quite like interviewing Winston. Um, I find um, Liam Brown very difficult. <laughs> um, I can't understand anything he says. Um, but... Um, yeah, I don't know, is it just me or, um, mm. yeah, I, I, so uh, it, it's fun interviewing the confrontational ones, guys like Stephen Joyce or Jerry Brownlee, they'll come back at you, Helen Clark was the same, Michael Cullen, Winston Peters, Key's hard to interview because you, you hit him and it just slides off and he's like, he doesn't ever seem too phased by it, um, he doesn't react to you, the tension is natural, uh, tension is quite good. That's a really interesting way of putting it because some, quite frequently you know, I've heard you interview him and, and he says things that 
would have been a real problem for any other politician. Yeah, it's a funny one. He um, he just like if he was interrupted by a nineteen-year-old student journalist, he would just shut up immediately. You know, it's amazing when you watch him. I mean, he you know, like most politicians, like Helen Clark would have said, you know. Who are you? You know, like, um, and and she would just like give you the death stare, even if you've been in the gallery for ten years. But Key, I mean, his his whether it's a natural thing about his personality or a, a tactic, it's hard to separate the two. But he um, he just um, he just doesn't seem to get rattled at all or get angry at all, um, and so. Yeah, as an interviewer, you're kind of looking for reaction. It's it's uh, it's hard to explain, I suppose, but it's a bit like yeah, it's a bit like clutching at mist, I suppose, in some ways. Um, these haven't necessarily been easy times for for Radio New Zealand because y your budget <coughs> has not increased in the last eight years now, um, and I imagine there have been sacrifices. But I also I'm also guessing that that rather good survey that you had um, last month would have um, been quite a fillip. Was, how was that received? Totally. I mean, that was, it was really nice to be compared with the um, commercial stations. And it was cool that people are listening to, you know, three years of pretty serious radio in the morning, which was cool. I think it was cool for journalism too. Um, so that, that was nice. Uh, you're right, a frozen budget, although uh, Paul Thompson says, you know, having a frozen budget in the media can be quite a good uh, thing at the moment because everyone else's budgets are, what, melting away. Um, <laughs> Nah, my word's actually not his, but um, the sentiment's the same. Um, and he, I think, has been incredibly creative and skillful at, at um, organising that money. Yeah, some things have gone by the wayside that, that we wouldn't have wanted to let go. Um, some things have had to be short or, or play less frequently. But he's managed to get, you know, Campbell on, on air in the studio and having that. It's pretty extraordinary, I think. Um, you know, as you say, on, on a fixed budget. So, you know, I think there's a lot of things to be proud of. Right, so you can see a way ahead. Yeah, definitely. And in fact, probably Radio New Zealand's um, position and role is probably more important than ever now um, you know when you look at what um, else is happening in, in the commercial media and the breakdown of the business model of a lot of journalism um, having taxpayer public funded uh, radio is incredibly important I think um, you only have to listen to the, the difference of the focus uh, that a lot of commercial media and it's you know I understand those pressures I've, I've worked in them but it's a, it's a very different beast and it's a very important thing to have, I think. You've self-identified about ten times since we've been talking as a journalist. Um, do you think it's, a, it's important that people in your kind of role <clears throat> do that? Because, because there, are, there have been people who've sat in the same seat as you who, who would not have called themselves journalists. Yeah, I mean, that's all I've ever done is journalism. Um, I don't know that I could do anything else. But... Um, yeah, I mean, I've always seen myself as a, as a journalist, and um, yeah, you do hear that, eh? You hear people say, oh, I'm a, I'm a broadcaster, not a journalist, so that means I can do X, Y, and Z at the same time. Um, the last person I heard say that was Sean Hannity. He said it yesterday or the day before, who's also advising Trump, um, as well as holding a, an hour of prime. It's a true story. The New York Times ran it big today. Sean Hannity, an hour of prime time on Fox News, and also advising Donald Trump. And he said, quote, I'm not a journalist, so and I'm making no secret of the fact that I want Trump to be the president of the United States. Again, his words, not mine. But um, yeah, it's um, it's an interesting tweet that. <laughs> Uh, it's an interesting one, but I've yeah, I mean, I've, I've always called myself a journalist. That's all um, what I've what I've what I've done. Have you ever been just finally actually because we have to uh, wrap up at the moment? Uh, have you ever been uh, tapped to go to the dark side? Because a lot of very good political journalists are now political comms professionals. No, oh, a couple of people have rung me from search firms and and asked um, asked me uh, to do stuff like that, but. Um, no, I haven't been tempted. Right. Do you think you'd be any good at it? I don't know. Um, I'd probably leak terribly. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, I've... <laughs> do you know what I mean? I mean, yeah. it's like, wow, you should hear about this. Uh, <laughs> I always wondered what it would be like to be in the, um, you know, working for a minister. You get given the cabinet papers and you're like, oh, Liam, oh, Corin, oh, Duncan, <laughs> Paddy, you, you know. Um, so... Yeah, yeah. Anyone who watches this won't hire me now, will they? So. No. <laughs> exactly. On 95. 95. 95. 95. 95. 95. 95. 95. 95.